Hello, I'm Adam Powell. I'm a general pediatric cardiologist here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and my primary interest is in exercise, and exercise and congenital heart disease mostly. And so I'm going to talk to you about, uh, give you an introduction to pediatric cardiopulmonary exercise testing, specifically as it relates to uh, your education as a clinical cardiology fellow. So we're going to go over the ABP content specifications, and I think I think this is important because this is really what the American Board of Pediatrics decides that you need to know about exercise in our congenital heart disease patients. And so going through these, the first topic and we're actually not going to discuss in this in this lecture because it is such a wide content specification. It's probably another thirty minute talk by itself. But knowing the guidelines for exercise and normal children and children with congenital heart disease, what we will go through is we will go through the rest of these content specifications point by point uh, during our talk. And whenever we are uh, talking about uh, content specification that's going to be on the board exam, uh, I will point those out in bold red font. We will talk, discuss uh, the ability to recognize the normal responses to exercise in terms of heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac output, oxygen uptake, cons and consumption of venous return. Uh, we'll discuss uh, how to understand the ventral response to CO2 in terms of CO2 response curves and central peripheral chemoreceptors. We'll discuss how we understand the physiologic principles involved in the ventilatory responses to exercise. We'll discuss the indications and risk of exercise testing in children. We'll also discuss the techniques, physiology, advantages, and disadvantage of different types of exercise, specifically cycle versus treadmill mostly. We'll discuss the physiologic principles related to EKG response to exercise. And then lastly, we'll finish up discussing the indications of nuclear medicine stress testing. So why exercise testing? I like this diagram uh, made famous in the Wasserman textbook uh, that just demonstrates kind of complex interplay between the pulmonary, cardiac, and musculoskeletal systems and that the lungs help provide the oxygen which is transported by the heart and our circulatory system to the muscle so that oxygen can, can, can then be used as fuel to ultimately lead to ATP. And then those that same cardiac and pulmonary circulations help to clear the aerobic and anaerobic byproducts. And, and all this complex diagram just helps to further demonstrate that it is very complex and it's not just about the heart. So what fuels exercise? I kind of alluded to it already, that it's all about ATP. And so oxygen from the atmosphere is consumed in muscle to form ATP. This is a process uh, called oxidative phosphorylation. And many of you guys probably remember from your old organic chemistry days in undergrad. So ATP is acquired from muscle in three different ways. The first way is early in exercise, there's uh, anaerobic hydrolysis of phosphocreatine. This really results in a net carbon dioxide consumption. Then later in exercise, we uh, utilize the aerobic oxidation of fatty acids and glycogen. And in this one, the oxygen consumed is really equal to the substrate present. And, and really the net uh, oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production is about the same. And then kind of, that's kind of the tail end of exercise, uh, our body uses anaerobic oxidation of glycogen by pyruvate uh, to yield ATP. But this also yields lactic acid, uh, which is buffered by sodium bar bicarb, and this in turn leads to carbon dioxide byproduct. Uh, and really all these above process occurs by the interplay between the cellular, cardiac, and respiratory systems. So this is a graphic representation of what I just discussed. and. Really, this is absolutely nothing that anybody needs to memorize. It's just a different demonstration of how our body generates ATP. And it's also uh, always nice whenever you can work in some organic chemistry in a cardiology talk. So what is the difference between aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism? So in aerobic metabolism, i.e. below the anaerobic threshold, uh, the body's in a steady state where oxygen meets the needs for the generation of ATP in muscles. Comparing that to anaerobic metabolism, which is above the anaerobic threshold, in this one, oxygen flow is inadequate to supply the total oxygen need and lactic acidosis develops. And that's what this diagram to the right shows uh, in a patient who's undergoing aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism on the bottom. And as lactic acid uh, starts building up, the 
carbon dioxide byproducts starts to exceed the amount of oxygen consumed. And that's what this bottom right curve is showing. Uh, compared to the top right curve, in which, so, which this patient's undergoing aerobic metabolism, and it's kind of really in a steady state of oxygen consumption consumed versus CO2 produced. So next we're gonna talk a little bit more about lactate, specifically how the lactate increases in response to different work weights. And the table, the figure on the bottom right corner kind of shows that, where in moderate activity, i.e. below the anaerobic threshold. This is that steady state where oxygen consumption is about the same as CO2 produced. Uh, the lactate rises just kind of stays around the same level. It doesn't particularly uh, increase anymore. And because of that, the bicarb, what buffers it, is not really consumed any as well. Now, as you, in, as you exercise above the anaerobic threshold, uh, you start seeing a sustained constant lactate increase. And, and this is really relatively balanced between utilization and production. And it's also, as you start having lactate build up, you lose that steady state. And so you're no longer having a true steady state and you instead have fatigue. And then lastly, when you have very heavy exercise, uh, the lactate continues to rise even higher uh, and then it increases the fatigue and fatigue earlier than when you were doing heavy activity. You can have a pronounced uh, metabolic acidosis during very heavy exercise and lactate levels at this time can exceed 10 millimoles per liter. So now to talk about the timing of lactate increases, and I think this can be pretty interesting, not just in our cardiac patients, but just in, in, in patients as a whole and, and, and people who like fitness as a whole. And really what this kind of slide boils down to and this figure on the right boils down to is that the more fit you are and the younger you are, the longer it takes for you to read and an roach threshold and the longer it takes for lactate to build up. And so in elite athletes and, and really, really fit people, uh, the anaerobic threshold can be quite close to their peak oxygen consumption. Now, as you get older and as you get more deconditioned, as you get sicker, uh, and, and especially more so when you have heart failure, the earlier you have lactate building up. And so the earlier your anaerobic threshold occurs. So if we have high lactate in our blood, we need to have a way to buffer it to help decrease the metabolic acidosis. And, and as a buffer, uh, the bicarbonate levels in our body starts to decrease as the lactate increases. Now this ultimately results in increased carbon dioxide production. This is very helpful in the lab because we don't routinely measure lactate in the lab as a way to determine anaerobic threshold because it's invasive, it requires blood draws. But we can readily measure the byproduct of this process, the CO2. Uh, we can do that relatively easily. And, and with that, we can help to determine roughly where this anaerobic threshold is in patients. So this next topic can be a little bit uh, confusing as you get in, really into the weeds of what is the anaerobic threshold and what can we measure with the anaerobic threshold. And so really, uh, these thresholds is the point where the muscle oxygen supply becomes critical and arterial lactate increases. And so there's multiple different terminologies for these. One is the anaerobic threshold. This is the oxygen consumption, which the anaerobic metabolism overtakes aerobic. Another term for this fresh threshold is the lactic, lactate threshold. This is the oxygen consumption where the net increase in lactate production exists. Contrast that to the lactic acidosis threshold. This is the oxygen consumption in which the arterial bicarb decreases, i.e. the buffer for the lactate starts to decrease. Or, in the byproduct of this, the increase in CO2 output. Now, we don't readily measure any of these three thresholds in our lab on a uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. We, talk, we met, tend to measure the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. And so these thresholds are more academic, but the ventilatory anaerobic threshold is the one that we use more of all. And we're going to talk about that later in our talk. So we're 12 slides in, and we have yet to talk about any cardiology that's familiar for many of y'all. And, and, and I imagine many of you are staring at the screen pretty glassy-eyed 
uh, by now. And so really this slide is meant to, to really bring it home, to, to really relate this to things that is familiar to you uh, and, and, and relating it back to clinical cardiology. And, and so here you have the Fick equation. And by rearranging the Fick equation, we see that VO2 or oxygen consumption, one of the main variables we measure in exercise testing, uh, equals stroke volume times heart rate times the AVO2 difference. And these are things that we can measure uh, in, in, the, in the exercise lab and things that can kind of help us understand normal cardiac physiology. I think another interesting kind of factoid uh, of exercise testing is that rest, the stroke volume is about 60% of the stroke volume at peak exercise. I think that's something probably worthwhile to remember. I think another thing to, to, to remember is that cardiac output in normal healthy people increases the four to five times baseline at peak exercise. Now, in a lot of our patients are congenital cardiac patients who are really deconditioned and have significant heart disease, the cardiac output may not only may only increase about three, two to three times that of baseline at peak exercise. So I think it's important here to talk about kind of the physiology of exercise and the differences on dif the different stages of exercise and how we can augment our exercise function uh, based on what stage of exercise we're in. So in early exercise, early exercise, the main factor is increased preload. And this occurs by increased stroke volume, secondary to the increased venous return, and increased sympathetic tone. Now, it's worth knowing that later in exercise, as heart rate increases, this decreases the diastolic filling time. And preload really has less of an effect later in exercise as opposed to earlier in exercise. Now, late in exercise, there's a linear relationship between work rate and heart rate. This results in a couple things. One is the widening of the AVO2 difference uh, as there's increased oxygen extraction at the muscles. And also as lactate and carbon dioxide increases, uh, this lowers the pH, and this in turn shifts the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve to the right. And this results in increased oxygen extraction later in exercise. One of our content specs that I listed earlier was to discuss the physiology of exercise. And I think this slide really kind of summarizes all that very nicely. Uh, if you look at Q, cardiac output, uh, which we previously said uh, increases about four to five times a baseline, this graph shows that. It does show that the systolic blood pressure uh, increases, um, but the diastolic blood pressure tends to either stay stable or maybe even decrease slightly. Now this ultimately results in a net increase in the main arterial pressure and then lastly, this graph also shows that the SVR drops uh, uh, the longer with exercise as well. There are also gender differences with exercise testing, and that's what this figure to the right uh, shows very nicely, is that in females, uh, they tend to have a higher cardiac output, but they do tend to have a lower oxygen consumption. Uh, additionally, they also tend to have a lower hemoglobin. Since they have a lower hemoglobin, they have a lower oxygen content. And, 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 and this, this means that female uh, athletes, female patients that we test in the exercise lab are much more sensitive to anemia. And so that is something to kind of consider if you do have a female patient that does do very, uh, very poorly in the oxygen consumption and exercise testing is what is their hemoglobin content. Now we are going to transition to the actual exercise test. What is cardiopulmonary exercise testing? Well, it allows us to simultaneously study cardiac and pulmonary responses to exercise. And we're able to do this because gas exchange of the airway is a direct response to cardiac output, pulmonary blood flow, and peripheral oxygen extraction coupled with ventilation. Now, when we have the test, we also include blood pressure, oxygen saturation and EKG monitoring. And we compare these with the gas measures to relate to the actual exercise performance to make it a more useful, especially a more clinically useful test. In addition, including these other parameters allows us to have better monitoring and improve the safety profile of the test. So what are the indications for exercise testing? Uh, and this is a content specification. Uh, so common reasons for stress testing is really to evaluate signs and symptoms, 
uh, that are induced by aggravated by exercise. You have a patient that has symptoms of exercise. You want to try to elicit the symptoms, see if it's pathologic or not. Two, you can assess or identify abnormal responses to exercise uh, in specific organ systems and to determine if any of these patients with a pathology in the organ system has any evidence of myocardial ischemia or arrhythmias. And that's the, really the EKG modeling of the test. You do it to assess the efficacy of specific medical or surgical treatments, uh, i.e. are the heart failure treatments that you're giving, uh, are they having improved exercise tolerance? You can assess the functional capacity for recreational, athletic, and vocational activities. Um, you can evaluate the prognosis, uh, both baseline or serial testing measurements, especially in the ACHD, the adult congenital population, um, performing serial testing and kind of see how uh, how they're doing over the years that you're following them. It can be very, very helpful uh, when it, with these patients. And then finally, to establish baseline data uh, for the institution of cardiopulmonary or musculoskeletal rehabilitation, and really to see if the uh, rehabilitation measures you're doing, if it offers improvement. What are the contraindications to exercise testing? So we have absolute and relative contraindications. If you look at the absolute contraindications, the first four just really boil down to inflammation and severe systemic inflammation. Additionally, an absolute contraindication is severe systemic hypertension. Uh, and then a more of a common sense contraindication is if there's, a, if there's an orthopedic injury that prevents them from exercising either on the treadmill or the bike. The relative contraindications, these are patients that we do test, but they do have a higher risk of having issues on exercise testing. These are any kind of severe LVOT obstructions uh, or coronary artery disease, anything that could possibly lead to coronary artery ischemia, uh, severe RVOT obstructions, congenitive heart, congestive heart failure, specifically, you know, really severe heart failure, um, pulmonary vascular obstruction disease, pulmonary hypertension, severe mitral stenosis, and then advanced ventricular arrhythmias. So what is about the safety of exercise testing, or put it a different way, what are the indications for terminating an exercise test? For one, if there's signs or symptoms of insufficient cardiac output, so if there's failure of the heart rate or systolic blood pressure rise with exercise, or probably more strongly, is there a drop in systolic blood pressure during exercise? If there is, stop the test. Uh, second indication to stop the test would be severe hypertension. That would be systolic blood pressure greater than 250 millimeters of mercury, or if it's so high you're unable to measure it uh, with the machine or oscillatory uh, methods of, that you have available in the lab. A third more indication for termination is if there's greater than 3 millimeter ST segment depression during test. Also, if there's increasing ventricular ectopy on exercise, or if there's greater than three beat run of ventricular ectopy, that's another indication to stop the test. Kind of more relative indications based on the patient and the pathology is a 10 point drop in oxygen saturation, or just symptoms that the patient finds uncomfortable. If it's tachycardic, if they're just dyspneic, if they're having leg, leg pain, chest pain, and so just kind of patient, uh, patient complaints. So is exercise testing safe? So I include this study because I really like it. Um, it came from the Boston Experience from 2013, 2015, and they, they tested a wide variety of patients. Uh, a large percentage of them were very normal, a normal patient with no pathology, but also quite a few complex cardiac defects uh, in there as well. And in their patients, the vast, vast majority of them, 54% had zero arrhythmias, and 46% of them, uh, had arrhythmias that did not require a test termination. So kind of like isolated PVCs, isolated PACs, really kind of non-clinically uh, relevant arrhythmias for the test. Only 0.5% of patients roughly uh, had an arrhythmia that required termination of the test. Only five patients required intervention at termination of the test. Two of those are vagal maneuvers, and three of them were cardioversion. So three out of the over 5,000 tests required a cardioversion, and all three of those were in patients who had existing ICDs in place, and they were all existing shock uh, with conversion of sinus rhythm afterwards. So exercise testing, even in our high-risk congenital heart disease patients, are very, very safe.
So the very specific guidelines for how a cardiopulmonary exercise lab should be set up, and these are really based on the Washington guidelines from circulation back in 1994. These aren't necessarily things to memorize. These are more if you're going to go and, and be in charge of your own exercise lab one day. But ideally, there should be about 500 square feet with good ventilation. The ambient temperature should be about 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. It should be a child-friendly space, especially for these pediatric uh, congenital heart disease patients. They have varying levels of cognitive function and developmental uh, developmental milestones met and so really to try to make it as pediatric friendly as possible helps so posters tv on child appropriate music uh, anything to kind of help decrease apprehension ideally you should have two trained competent staff members present for each test uh, and a physician should be available for high risk patients uh, in the exercise lab there should be a well stocked emergency resuscitation cart present Day of testing, ideally there should be no food for two hours prior to the study. The patient should arrive in loose, comfortable clothing and shoes. Uh, when they arrive for testing, have complete medical history, review of medications, and baseline EKG should be done before they're tested. And this really helps to identify patients who may have a contraindication at testing. And then finally, meaningful written consent should be obtained uh, in most laboratories prior to participation. The equipment needed includes the metabolic heart, the electrocardiogram, blood pressure monitoring, pulse oximetry, and the ergometer. And this is when we'll discuss whether it's a cycle versus a treadmill. So here's a picture of our exercise physiology lab at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And we have three distinct bays. Each bay has a treadmill, a cycle ergometer. Uh, we have the ability to, to position our metabolic coronal EKG machine. Uh, based on what modality we're using to test the patients. Not seeing this picture, but behind us uh, is our emergency crash cart, uh, which is present for every one of our tests. So what is a metabolic cart? It's an analyzer that measures gas exchange, um, measures the amount of CO2 that's excreted, for instance. It's often, off, it's often also used to perform pulmonary function tests. An additional aspect that certain metabolic carts can do is it can use inert gases to help measure cardiac output directly. To do this, it uses a system in a bag that contains oxygen, inert diffusible gas, and inert non-diffusible gas. After one to two breaths, the non-diffusible gas equilibrates between the lungs and the bag. The diffusible gas was removed in proportion to the blood flow, and with this, we can measure cardiac output. To do this, you have to assume that there's no intracardiac shunting. If there's intracardiac shunting, the uh, measurements aren't quite as accurate. We also use EKG monitoring. This should be rec continuous recording uh, needed for safety. There's a 12-lead EKG that should be recorded at rest and then at various time periods during the exercise test. Uh, most EKG carts have automated detection of arrhythmias and ST segment changes, which is very helpful. And then most EKG programs also average the recorded signals, allowing QRS and ST segment monitoring. Blood pressure monitoring should occur for e every exercise test. Now this can be difficult secondary to motion artifact and noise, particularly in patients tested on the treadmill. The direct auscultation method is preferred for monitoring blood pressure. There are automated systems that are available, but they're often inaccurate. Now, the caveat to this is that some labs have an automated system that does allow for direct auscultation. Pulse oximetry should also be continuously recorded. It's usually the finger or the ear, but also could be on the forehead. The difficulty with this is that uh, at peak exercise, there can be a lot of noise and that can affect the accuracy of the pulse oximetry. But it is important to see desaturation at peak exercise, particularly in our congenital heart disease patients who may have shunting uh, versus increase in their VQ mismatch. So to go to our, back to our content specifications, how do you know whether to use a cyclogometer versus a treadmill for exercise testing? So they each have different advantages and disadvantages, and we're going to go through those briefly. So the advantages of the cyclogometer is that it's well studied. The other thing is you can really more accurately measure workload, which is important uh, as a way to 
to measure power and any amount of power that a patient exhibits on exercise testing. It is more quiet than the treadmill, and so it also has less EKG artifact. It also takes up less space than a treadmill. The disadvantage of it is it does require more coordination, more motor coordination in the patient. It also does tend to have lower peak VO2s and heart rates uh, because it does use less muscles than the treadmill. There are multiple different protocols, but two main ones are a James protocol, which is a staged, uh, or the more commonly used ramp protocol, which is continuous. The treadmill advantage is that it does tend to have a slightly higher VO2 and heart rate uh, than the cycle. Running is also generally a more natural movement for most people than cycling. And it is much better for younger patients, patients that don't quite have the motor coordination for the cyclogometer. Now the disadvantage of it is it's loud, so it's hard for blood pressure. It does have significant motion artifact on EKG. There is no really accurate measure of workload on the EKG. And the last one is kind of the question why safety. There's been some concerns that uh, if someone falls off uh, a cycle ergometer, it's safer for them if they fall off a treadmill. Really ideally, you should have enough uh, staffing around to help minimize the, uh, uh, the concern of falling off the treadmill. There are different protocols. Bruce and Balkies are both staged protocols, and there are some, um, some ramp protocols in, tre in treadmill testing as well. So this is just a comparison table uh, of the treadmill versus the cycle ergometer. And this is adapted from Nottis, uh, a chapter that Jonathan Rhodes wrote uh, from Boston. And it really it kind of reemphasizes the things that we already discussed. But is a content specification, so why it is worthwhile uh, learning this. And this is, again, it was really a lot of the same things uh, discussing the pros and cons of treadmill versus cycle ergometry. This, this one taking from Moss and Adams. So now we're going to start transitioning to what do we actually measure on the cardiopulmonary exercise test and how do we interpret those measurements. So the respiratory exchange ratio, or, or otherwise known as RER, or sometimes RQ, which means respiratory quotient. This is the ratio between the carbon dioxide produced and the oxygen consumed, the ratio between VCO2 and VO2. At rest, the RER tends to be roughly around 0.6 to 0.8. Now it is higher at rest if someone has a really heavy carbohydrate consumption, i.e. someone ate a whole load of pancakes right before they came to the lab, the, v, the RER can be uh, closer to one. On the converse, it's also lower if they have a diet high in fat consumption. Now around 1.0, the RER of 1.0, the CO2 production equals the oxygen consumption. And this is sometimes used as a surrogate for anaerobic threshold. It's not quite the same thing, but it can be similar. In general, when an RER is greater than 1.1, this strongly suggests a max effort test. Now we use this along with the heart rate response and subjective effort to determine if this patient truly had a max effort test or not. So I think it's important to recognize the blood pressure response is not just the exercise testing, but as exercise as a whole. So in isometric exercise, i.e. powerlifting, you can see both an increase in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. They can both be quite marketed. During isotonic exercise, i.e. running cycling, there's a more of a modest increase in systolic blood pressure, with diastolic blood pressure being more or less the same. Now, during exercise testing, you occasionally see a depressed systolic blood pressure response. That's one of those worrisome signs. If you see that, it's an indication to terminate the test. And you see that in cardiomyopathy, basically a, a depressed cardiac output state. If there's a severe LV, LV outflow tract obstruction, severe AV valve insufficiency, and coronary artery disease. An exaggerated systolic blood pressure response uh, or uh, systolic blood pressure greater than 220 millimeters of mercury. Mostly for us, you see in patients with coarctation, but you can also see it in renal vascular disease, certain autoimmune vascular disease, and then lastly, essential hypertension is an, probably the most common reason to have an exaggerated systolic blood pressure response. And just as a reminder, if there's a fall in the systolic blood pressure during the test, stop the test. And if there's a fall in systolic blood pressure, 
following exercise, meaning they've finished exercise, but they're standing there, that's more of just an exaggerated vasodepressor response. Pulse oximetry is also quite important to measure during exercise testing. Now, unreliable waveforms are common, especially at peak exercise, as there's quite a lot of motion artifact. Generally, uh, a pulse ox less than 90% is considered abnormal. Now the exception to this rule is some elite endurance athletes will desaturate with exercise. It's also important to consider uh, in cases of low pulse ox if there's sources of shunting available, if they have a PFO, if they have a fenestration for example. Also important to consider is are they desaturated less than 90% of baseline before you exercise them. Heart rate. So we define a normal peak heart rate as 220 minus the age in years. On an exercise test, the goal is to have a peak heart rate about 85% of their predicted, which is that 220 minus the age in years. If it's less than 85% of predicted, then we call that an abnormal heart rate response or chronotropic incompetence. Now, there is some other measures you can do with heart rate, such as the heart rate reserve. That's, as the, that's defined as the peak heart rate minus the resting heart rate. And this does have some prognostic significance in certain heart defects, particularly uh, some of the adult congenital patients. Finally, functional capacity. This is the VO2. This is the oxygen consumption. This is probably the most important single measure of cardiopulmonary fitness that we can elicit on an exercise test. And, and really, this uses the interplay between the cardiac, pulmonary, and musculoskeletal systems to give us a, just a general measure of fitness. Now, some caveats with VO2. Uh, in adults, the VO2 does typically plateau at peak exercise. So one way to determine if it's peak exercise or not is has the VO2 plateaued? Kids don't particularly do that. The kids can generally just kind of keep climbing until they maximize out. Now, this is a nice table that just shows some general index per body weight normals for VO2. And some people do, when they have exercise tests, tend to look at the VO2 per kilogram. So in general, on average, a teenage boy should have around 45 to 50 milliliters per kg per minute. Uh, VO2 on an exercise test to be normal. And a teenage girl on average, uh, about mid mid thirties to be considered normal on the VO2 if you index it by body weight. Now, as you saw in the previous slide, max VO2 does tend to change based on age and gender. And so, while some people like to report the VO2 and index it for body weight, other people use different predictive regression equations to report a percent predicted value. Uh, and that's what we do in our lab. And in this, when you see a percent predicted value, generally greater than 80% is considered normal. Now these percent predicted values are derived from different regression equations such as Wasserman or Hansen. And, and I didn't include them on this PowerPoint, but if someone's interested in it, they can always email me uh, later and I can uh, forward the information to you. I think one major pitfall of using percent predicted values is you are relying on the person who reports the exercise data or yourself to ensure that the correct regression equation is used. And so if you get a, a value that's kind of screwy, that doesn't make a lot of sense, it may just be because they didn't choose the right equation. And so make sure that they're using the pediatric versus the adult equation, the overweight, underweight male equation versus the normal weight male or female equation. Additionally, another caveat with max VO2 is that in the morbidly obese patients, using the actual body weight does tend to underestimate the VO2. Um, that's because fat is a metabolically inactive tissue. Some labs will use the ideal body weight uh, to help index and help to uh, determine the VO2. Now, this has a caveat as well, is that if you use an equation for ideal body weight, this does tend to overestimate VO2. And so these are things to kind of consider um, when you have 
absolute VO2 values in front of you and you're trying to interpret them for your individual patients. So to bring all those earlier slides from my very beginning of my presentation home to this, uh, we come to the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. And so this is the anaerobic threshold measure that we can actually detect in our lab. Now, this is not effort dependent, uh, which is very nice, as opposed to the max VO2, which is absolutely effort dependent. The, if it's actually me measured, it's actually quite a sensitive marker of fitness, um, with normal values being around 50 to 65% of their predicted max VO2. Now, the major disadvantage of this measure is that it can be difficult to measure. There's a, quite a bit of user variability with how you measure. I'll show you here. So the main way that we determine the ventilatory anaerobic threshold uh, is this V-slope method. Now, what this is, is it's the respiratory compensation point on a plot of minute ventilation versus the VCO2. And when that slope has its inflection point, as you see here in this, see here in this figure, this RC, that inflection point is in turn the VAT. Now, this figure makes it look very, very easy. In reality, it's even more so in our pediatric patients who have disordered breathing and hyperventilate and hypoventilate during exercise, and, 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 and these graphs are kind of all over the place, there's a little bit more subjectivity to where is that inflection point actually occurring. And so there's, um, a large percent of our patients that are really unable to uh, accurately detect uh, or quantify the vent ventilatory anaerobic threshold based on this method. So that's just something to consider um, when you're interpreting your exercise tests. To relate it to previous slides in which we discussed the anaerobic threshold, um, this is a comparison between the anaerobic threshold, which is a theoretical point where tissue metabolism changes from aerobic to anaerobic, which leads to increased tissue lactate and thus increased serum lactate, which is pretty impractical to test as it would require invasive uh, testing. Compare that to the ventilatory anaerobic threshold, which is an approximation of the point where oxygen demand is greater than supply. This results in an increased lactate, which leads to an increased bicarbonate buffering, and this in turn increases CO2 production. Now, it's also important to remember that ventilatory anaerobic threshold is an indirect approximation of the true anaerobic threshold. So work rate, uh, otherwise known as power, and it's reported in either a watt or kilopons per minute, um, is really only directly measured on the cycle ergometer. Now we can calculate on the treadmill based on using the height, weight, grade, and speed, but it's not always 100% accurate. Now there are some normal values that can be calculated. So the normal values for uh, a girl or a prepubescent boy is three watts per kilo. And for a postpubescent boy, about 3.5 watts per kilo. And this is really calc this is really taken from uh, the textbook that Bar O wrote in 2004. Now, low power levels, low watts, uh, really has similar causes to low VO2, in addition to neurologic and musculoskeletal disease. Oxygen pulse is a non-invasive measure of stroke volume. So it's really a math-based derived way of determining what is the stroke volume on a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And it's determined as the functional capacity divided by the heart rate. Another way is if you rearrange the Frick equation is the oxygen pulse equals the stroke volume times the AVO2 difference. Since there's minimal change in the AVO2 difference over time, it's most useful to trend the O2 pulse in individual patients and subsequent tests. Because when you use the O2 pulse as a surrogate for stroke volume, you're making some assumptions. You're making assumptions that there's a stable hemoglobin, that uh, there's a stable oxygen consumption, and that the AVO2 difference is unchanged over time. Now, this does tend to be abnormal in patients with depressed ventricular function, uh, 
severe valve artery disease, systemic hypertension, coronary artery disease, Fontan circulations, and pulmonary vascular disease. It does underestimate the stroke volume in patients with anemia and arterial desaturation, which is a lot of our patients, uh, and it overestimates stroke volume in patients with polycythemia or in athletes. And this, again, is often presented as a percent predicted with over 80% uh, considered normal. The VE VCO2 slope. This is the relationship between the ventilatory equivalence, or VE, and carbon dioxide production, or VCO2. And this is really kind of a measure of ventilatory efficiency. How efficient is the ventilation on exercise? The VE VCO2 rises linearly until anaerobic threshold. And at which time, at that point, the VE, the ventil ventilatory equivalence, rises faster. There are some difficulties with measuring the VE VCO2 slope. So, for instance, at what points of the exercise test are you measuring the VE VCO2 slope? Are you measuring it from rest to peak, to the onset of activity, to anaerobic threshold, onset of activity to peak exercise? Labs tend to do this differently. And so, uh, if you're going to use this as a clinical measure, um, it's best to know how is this actually measured and is it measured consistently? And, the same way every time. Now, steeper slopes, i.e. a higher VEVCO2 slope, is seen in cases of increased ventilation or reduced VCO2. So it's higher uh, in patients that are not breathing very efficient. Additionally, it's also higher if right to left shunting exists. This is because deoxygenated blood, the hydrogen and the CO2, uh, shunts to the systemic circulation. This stimulates our ventilation to clear the CO2 and thus increasing the VE VCO2 slope. This is a nice diagram just going into further detail into the pathophysiology behind ventilatory inefficiency in our heart failure patients. So to interpret a VE VCO2 slope, a normal, depending on which article you're reading, is anywhere from 32 to 34. This has shown prognostic significance in adult heart failure and transposition uh, with an atrial repair or mustard sinning. It's commonly abnormal in tetralogy flow patients if there's residual stenosis. It's also commonly abnormal in Fontan patients, secondary to VQ mismatch. Now, it's also worthwhile to mention that it can be abnormal in Fontan patients, too, if they have any sort of residual site of shunting, large amounts of collaterals, fenestration present, uh, etc. It's also elevated, as I just said, if there's elevated uh, right-to-left shunt, if that exists, or if there's elevated PPR. So this is a nice summary slide from this article in 2014. And while really none of these measures are a specific content specification for the boards, I thought this was just nice, more as a reference table, so that when you're uh, off in real life as a cardiologist reading and interpreting your own exercise test, you have some sort of uh, reference to fall back to to kind of help you interpret what these measures mean in real time and ultimately offer the best amount of care possible to all of our patients. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about the pulmonary response to exercise, which actually has quite a bit of content specifications in regards to the boards. So one of the content specifications is to know the pulmonary responses to exercise. So the goal for the pulmonary system is for a given oxygen consumption that the minute carbon dioxide eliminated and the pH maintains a rather narrow physiologic window. Now there is a tight relationship between minute ventilation, oxygen consumption, and CO2 production, and that's shown on the figure to the right. At ventilatory anaerobic threshold, the minute ventilation increases out of proportion to the oxygen consumption, and at peak, where lactic acid is increasing, there's the metabolic acidosis, and they both tend to rise. Minute ventilation, or VE, is defined as the tidal volume times the respiratory rate. Now, minute ventilation or an exercise onset increases 
by mostly by increasing title volume. Now the dead space to title volume ratio changes from 30 to 35% at rest to about 5 to 15% uh, during exercise onset as more dead space is utilized. At higher exercise, it increases both by increased tidal volume as well as increased respiratory rate. Breathing reserve is a measure that we use to determine if there's a pulmonary limitation exercise. Now, it is rare to have pulmonary limitations exercise because you know, our lungs have a built-in reserve. This breathing reserve is further untapped ability to increase the VE at peak, the minute ventilation at peak. There are multiple different calculations for breathing reserve, and I just put them here. Every lab kind of uses a different variation of this. But another thing to consider, though, too, is all these calculations uses the MVV, or maximum voluntary ventilation. Is this measured, or is this calculated? If it's calculated, it's the FEV1 times 40. And these, these other equations are mostly just for your referencing. Pulmonary function testing it can be quite important in our patients. Post-op, cardiac patients often do have restrictive lung disease. And what is restrictive lung disease? Again, the definition of that is decreased FVC and FEV1, and often, not always, often a normal FEV1 to FVC. Despite having restrictive lung disease, an abnormal pulmonary function test at baseline, our patients still usually have normal breathing reserves. Additionally, a caveat with pulmonary function testing, especially in the really young ch children, is they can have abnormal pulmonary function testing just because they're so young they don't know how to do the test. Or they just have disordered breathing and exercise. Young children tend to hyperventilate early until kind of towards the end of exercise and they get tired and they start breathing a little more efficiently again. So we already said before that every patient should have EKG analysis during exercise testing. So we do this to evaluate for multiple different things, including chronotropic impairments, such as in post-op congenital heart disease patients, exercise-induced arrhythmias, such as ectopy or catecholamine polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, myocardial ischemia, such as an anomalous coronary Kawasaki disease, conduction abnormalities, uh, QTC interval changes if you're evaluating a patient for long QT syndrome, pre-excitation and whether it disappears, uh, at peak exercise, indicating a low risk pathway versus staying persistent, or sinus bradycardia that doesn't increase if they have sinus node dysfunction. And then evaluating for pacemakers, evaluation of rate responsiveness and pacing rate responsiveness to exercise. So here are the, here's a table of the diagnoses associated with ST segment changes during exercise. The major ones to consider aortic stenosis, valvar, specifically supravalvar Williams syndrome, anomalous coronary arteries, Kawasaki syndrome with residual aneurysms, uh, transposition with an arterial switch, uh, heart transplants with coronary vasculopathy, uh, and then any kind of systemic uh, inflammation disease, myocarditis, uh, illnesses like that. So there's different techniques to measuring the ST segment, and, and both techniques have their advantages and disadvantages, but it's, it's probably good to get really good at recognizing one versus the other. So the first technique is you can use the PR isoelectric line, and that's the, the top EKG to the right that it shows. Um, the bottom one is the PQ-PQ isoelectric line. Now, they're both sensitive to artifact and baseline drift, and so that's something to consider. The PQ to PQ is easier, but does tend to have a higher amount of false positives. So one advantage of most of the contemporary EKG monitoring machines and their software is they do have the ability to signal average QRS beats to have a composite of the ST segment depression, uh, how many millimeters it's depressed, and the degree of slope of the ST segment depression. And, and that's what this EKG is showing with different, different segments of exercise. The top number is the average of ST segment depression or elevation, negative numbers depression, positive numbers elevation. And the bottom number is the slope in general. Uh, Obviously, if you have 
the top number higher or lower, meaning if it's if it's less than negative three or positive than negative three, those are concerning for ST segment changes. Uh, and then the bottom number, the slope, the higher the slope is, um, the more generally the more reassuring uh, that the ST segments are, that it may just be a normal variation. Now there's caveats to this, um, but if you have an ST segment depression with a flat slope, that's much more concerning for pathology. This is another nice way the current software can kind of just kind of give you a graphic demonstration of ST segment changes, especially in the bottom portion of this. It can show you how the ST segments have changed over the entire test from rest to exercise to recovery. And this can be useful when it comes to interpreting the EKGs following an exercise test. So I have a couple of cases of EKGs in typical patients with pathology that we would see in an exercise lab. And so this first patient has CPVT. And you can see at rest in early exercise, heart rate of 97, it looks very normal and very reassuring. As we go to the next slide, as the heart rate increases, you can start seeing a little bit of ventricular ectopy and a pattern of bigeminy, two different morphologies. As the heart rate continues to increase, you see increasing ventricular ectopy until we get to 126 when there's a significant increase in ventricular ectopy with multiple different morphologies, which further increases as they get to faster heart rates. Further increasing ectopy in response to their increased uh, circulating catecholamines. But what's nice in these patients is as their heart rate decreases uh, closer to baseline and passes whatever this imaginary threshold is for these patients, uh, the ventricular ectopy tends to stop. And you can see 1.5 minutes in recovery for this patient, and the heart rate is, is back to normal with a normal. Uh, morphology of the QRS complexes. This patient demonstrated a very similar phenomenon in which at a below a certain heart rate, their EKGs were generally pretty reassuring, but as their heart rate increased to a certain level, they had increased ventricular arrhythmias. And as their heart rate increased, they started having to increasing ventricular ectopy until they eventually had an episode of quite significant ventricular tachycardia. Now, you can see that it continued even into recovery, but you can start to see some normal QRS segments here. Now, this patient did not require any intervention to break of this tachycardia. Lastly, we're going to have to talk a few slides about nuclear medicine stress testing, mostly because this is a content specification for the boards, and uh, it's kind of minimally covered in other, uh, other talks. So I thought I'd just kind of give you a couple slides on that. So nuclear medicine stress testing is used to assess myocardial ischemia, infarction viability. Uh, the particular pathologies that's used for is Kawasaki's disease, status post to arterial switch, anomalous coronaries, and cor coronary artery disease. It does rely on isotopes that are taken up into the myocardium into proportion with blood flow. To do this, images are taken at rest and at peak. And you have to ensure that there's enough time for the isotope to wash out. And so uh, following these images, you also check for reversibility. Now, you can have... Uh, negatives of this test. One is you do have to expose a patient to radiation and all the negatives of that it entails. It's also poorly specific. Here's an example of a normal nuclear medicine perfusion scan. Uh, as you look through the particular ventricular segments, you can see equal uptake of tracer in all the ventricular segments. This is an example of an abnormal nuclear medicine stress test where you can have kind of questionable uptake of the isotope uh, in the anterior segments of the ventricular wall. And so this would make you question a possible infarct in an 
uh, left anterior descending pattern. This slide shows my references for this talk. Thank you very much for listening to this. I hope you found this talk informative and, and helpful. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any suggestions or comments or questions. Uh, additionally, if you have any questions about exercise medicines in general or interpretation of exercise tests uh, just as a whole, please, please feel free to reach out to me, contact me uh, by this email address I provided. Thank you very much. Good luck in fellowship. Good luck in the boards. And I hope life treats all you guys very well.